be able to distinguish between endothermic and exothermic processes. To start off, let's start off with a simple equation. The universe equals the system plus the surroundings. So what in the world does that mean? Well, let's imagine an ice cube sitting in a glass of water. That will help us understand what that equation means. The ice cube is the system. The water is the surroundings. So the universe equals the system plus the surrounding. The universe equals the ice cube plus the water. So that glass of water with the ice cubes in it, in this case, represents the entire universe that we're observing. And the point is, the energy of the universe is constant. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. Now, there is energy within this glass of ice water, but there's no energy being created, there's no energy being destroyed, okay? The energy of the universe is constant. Now, to talk about heat, heat is the transfer of thermal energy, and heat always flows downhill. Heat always flows from a higher temperature down to a lower temperature. Let's take a look at our glass of water. The temperature of that water is, say, it's 8 degrees Celsius. Now, the temperature of the ice, well, we know water freezes at 0 degrees, so the temperature of the ice is 0 degrees Celsius. Now, the heat or the thermal energy is going to flow from the warm water into the colder ice cubes. So energy is not created or destroyed in this process. It is only transferred from the water into the ice. Thus, the total energy of the universe remains constant. Now, as heat is transferred from the water into the ice, the water molecules in the ice begin to move around faster and faster because that ice is absorbing the heat transfer from the water. So, the water molecules in the ice before the heat transfer, they are in a rigid form. They are vibrating in place. But the water molecules after the heat transfer, they're moving around a whole lot more. They're like sliding over each other. They have a lot more energy. So we can see that the ice went from, or the water went from a solid, the ice, to a liquid water. And that is colloquially known as melting. So the ice is melting as a result of the transfer of energy over the transfer of heat energy from the water into the ice. The system, which is the ice, absorbed energy from the surroundings, which is the water, causing the ice to melt. The surroundings, which is the water, loses heat energy and it drops in temperature. So this is why you put ice in water to make it cold. The ice absorbs the heat energy from the water, lowering the temperature of the water. And in the process, the ice melts. Whenever a system absorbs energy from its surroundings, it's called an endothermic process. So if we have a solid, turning into a liquid, it absorbs energy, and we call that melting. That is endothermic because it absorbed energy. Now, if we have a liquid absorbing energy, turning into a gas, that is evaporation, also an endothermic process because the system absorbed energy. And the system must absorb energy in order to speed up the movement of particles to make it change from a solid to a liquid to a gas. So whenever we're talking about absorbing energy, we're thinking endothermic.
Now an energy diagram shows us what happens to the energy as time goes on? This is an endothermic energy diagram. On the x-axis is the reaction progress. On the y-axis is the energy level. Now, as we begin whatever reaction we're talking about, we have, say we have a solid at the beginning as the low energy near the reactants. Now, as the reaction progresses, the energy is going to increase over the hump and then it's going to stop at a liquid which is at a higher energy than where the solid was. So if we started out at a low energy and we ended up at a higher energy then we absorbed energy. Energy is absorbed and that is an endothermic process. Now let's look at the opposite. Whenever a system releases energy into its surroundings, it's called an exothermic process. So say we have a gas. Now when that releases energy, then the particles slow down and the gas turns to a liquid. And that's called condensation, when a gas turns into a liquid. Condensation is an exothermic process. Energy is being released. Now, if we have a liquid, the particles are moving around each other. The particles have some a good amount of energy. But if they release that energy, then the particles will slow down so much that they become a solid. This process is called freezing. And again, freezing is an exothermic process. And finally, if we have a gas and it releases energy, slowing down the particles until they become straight to a solid then that is called deposition and since deposition releases energy then it is an exothermic process energy must exit the system in order for the particles to slow down enough to go from a gas to a liquid to a solid and in these cases since energy is exiting the system that's why we call it an exothermic process. Now before we look at an example of an exothermic process, let's remember that the universe equals the system plus the surroundings. Now in this example we're going to look at our universe is going to equal the system which is the sodium plus water which is the surroundings. And the energy of the universe as we recall it remains constant. Energy is not created or destroyed, only transferred. So we are going to observe this chemical reaction. Now in this chemical reaction, the sodium gets so hot that it catches fire. Now heat is transferred from the sodium, the system, to the water, the surroundings. So energy exited the system. Energy was released from the system. So we call this an exothermic process. Now the energy released by the system raised the temperature of the surrounding water. And so that's further proof that this is an exothermic reaction. And now let's look at the energy diagram for the exothermic process. So as we can see, the reactants are the sodium and water. They're at a high energy level. They have 
they have high energy. Now, when the reactants are combined, the reaction progresses. It goes over this hump, which I'll explain in a minute, and then the products end up all the way down at the bottom. The products are sodium hydroxide and hydrogen gas. They end up at low energy. So if we begin at high energy and we end at low energy, then energy was released into the system, raising the temperature. And that's why this is called an exothermic reaction. Now, this hump, what is this hump right here that we're looking at? That hump is the activation energy. Now, activation energy is the energy required to get the reaction started. Now, the sodium is not going to react on its own. Okay, it has to collide with water molecules in order to begin the reaction. Now, the collisions between the water molecules and the sodium atom, they provide that spark or that energy required to get the reaction going. And that's what this initial hump is. That's that spark. That's that activation energy. And as soon as enough energy is raised, then the reaction can proceed as normal.